if you look at the sun, we see solar flares. And in a solar flare, we've all seen the pictures of the photosphere of the sun and this large arc of plasma coming out. That plasma has current, electrical current flowing in it. And then we see this solar flare rip off of the sun. Mm -hmm. And that solar flare then can flow throughout and continue into the solar system. And for a little while anyway, it makes something called a plasmoid. That plasmoid is, in fact, electrical current flowing in the plasma, generating a magnetic field and holding it for longer than it would otherwise. And so we've observed these for 100 years, and we've known about these plasmoids for a long time. And there's researchers that have tried intentionally to make them. Um, but fundamentally, that's what we do every day is make one of these self-organized closed field plasmas. In a more controlled way at this rapid rate of one millionth of a second and being able to make sure it's reliable and stable and all that kind of stuff. So by the way, how do you keep the thing stable? And and there's the hard part okay. because I just described a solar flare. But yeah. and, and yes, we've seen the pictures of them, but we've also watched them and they, they appear, they fly away from the sun and then they go away. And that's not what we want in fusion, right? We want to be able to control this. And so that's the hard part of the job. Um, and so that's what we've spent the last number of years learning how to do ourselves and others on these pulsed closed field FRC systems. Hmm. Let's first talk about how to make them. And then we'll talk about how to make them stable because they're two different things. And we spent a lot of time on both. So we talked about time scale. So you have to reverse the field. You have to you have to change the electrical current in a millionth of a second. And so how do you do that? So I've described this system as you have a series of magnets. You have a magnetic field on the outside. And then on the inside of this, you have this donut, this FRC that has its own electrical current. And we didn't talk about this yet, but it's generated a magnetic field. And that magnetic field has pressure. And this is the other thing that's really interesting. So we talked about how this theta pinch compresses a magnetic field. It applies a pressure on the outside. Um, but the plasma itself has a pressure on the inside. And it has both a particle pressure, literally the particles bouncing. Think about hot gas in a balloon. The particles expanding, the ideal gas law expanding and contracting inside a balloon. But they also have a magnetic pressure. They have the electromagnetism is pushing back. And so I like to think about this as the motor in a Tesla. In your electric car, you have a motor, electric motor. And what that motor has is a series of windings. Those windings, you flow electrical current, in this case from a battery, hit the gas. Electricity flows from the battery into the motor, into those windings, and it generates an electromagnetic force, a Lorentz force is what it's technically called. This electromagnetic force induces an electrical current on the armature, on the shaft, and this is getting into the details, but into the armature of an electrical motor that actually is what spins. And so the outside of a motor doesn't spin. You have flow electrical current through it, and the inside does spin. That electromagnetic force is what is spinning that armature. In our case, we're inducing an electrical force in that electromagnet, and that's putting a electrical current, just like in the armature, into that plasma. And we can use that force to do interesting things. So that electromagnetic force can compress the fusion plasma. It can expand the fusion plasma. But here's the problem. It's unstable. And so this is something you learn very early in your graduate work uh, as a uh, student in fusion, is you learn about plasmas that are called high beta plasmas. So I keep seeing this plasma beta thing everywhere. What uh, What is this ratio of plasma field energy to confining magnetic field energy? Please explain. Plasma beta is the ratio of the magnetic pressure to the particle pressure. And so what that fundamentally means is I talked about how you have a magnetic field. And in that magnetic field, plasma is trapped in on that magnetic field. Um, but it's not very well trapped. It can escape. It can leave either down the ends, it can freely travel, or it can also travel um, across the magnetic field. And so we have a term called plasma beta, which gives us an understanding of how well trapped that plasma is. So as you apply a magnetic pressure, a magnetic field to this plasma, it pushes back. And does it push back a little or does it push back a lot? And for a field reverse configuration in one of our plasmas, uh, beta is very close to one. In fact, usually by definition, one at any point in, in the system, which means that every time I apply a magnetic force on this donut to compress it, the 
plasma particles on the inside push back. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is you have an equation for magnetic pressure, which is B squared over 2 mu naught. Um, the magnetic field squared is the external magnetic pressure. Any magnetic field anywhere generates this pressure. Um, but the plasma particles themselves also have a pressure. This is the ideal gas law. And we use the definition in KT, density, Boltzmann constant, and temperature for pressure. And in high beta, they're the same. B squared over 2 mu naught is in KT. So for a known magnetic field, I know what the density and the temperature of the plasma is. And just to circle back to it, when we talked about fusion, we talked about it had to be hot enough and it had to be dense enough. And that's N and that's T. And so now I have a very clear equation between magnetic field and density and temperature of the fusion fuel. And that's really critical. All plasmas have some, all fusion plasmas have some beta, some number. Um, the FRC has one of the highest betas, beta equal one. However, what you also learn in school, when you when you learn about beta the first time, is you learn that high beta plasmas are typically unstable. And so the good way to think about this is a tokamak is and a stellarator are stable because those plasmas that are going around in the donut, there's a force on that donut. But that plasma donut is very well held by all those magnetic fields, by all those magnetic coils. If it tried to move, it would be confined by that magnetic coil but in an FRC is unconfined. So the plasma is confined, but the whole topology can do something what is called tilt, is that this whole plasma donut, because it's under pressure, can just turn over. The way I think about this is, um, think about the, uh, a motor is a good example. In an armature, in the center of your motor, you have a spinning armature. You have this, this spinning magnet on the inside, and it is held by the main axis of the magnet. It can't go anywhere. We don't have that axis. We don't have any mechanical things inside these fusion systems. They're 100 million degrees. You can't put any mechanical things inside them. And so we have nothing to hold on to it. And so it's unstable. So when you learn about the FRC, that's the first thing you learn. Um, and it took us a number of years to learn about a parameter of how to make them stable. And 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 that and and that's pretty fundamental. But most people who've heard of an FRC haven't understood this really key fact. Um, and so we have a parameter we call S star over E. Um, and we're getting really into the physics weeds here. But but let's go. But it's really important. And the good analogy here is a top, mm -hmm. literally a top, a spinning top. And so you have a, a top spinning on your desk. You know that it'll spin for a little while, and then it will fall over. It is unstable. However, if you spin it fast enough, if you take a top and you spin it fast enough, put enough angular momentum, enough angular inertia into that system, it'll stay upright, even though it wants to just fall over, even though it's unstable. And we do the same thing in an FRC. Is if you can drive it fast enough, if you can add enough kinetic energy and inertia to the particles, it will stay stable. However, you can do another really key thing. We are not limited now to having a very skinny top. We can actually make it much bigger. So the good analogy here is if you have a coin and you know you're spinning that coin, um, if you spin it faster and faster, it'll stay spinning longer. Um, however, uh, eventually it'll slow down and fall over. But if you had a roll of duct tape, if you had something thicker and heavier and longer, and it's spinning around that same axis, it'll stay spinning even longer, both because of the inertia and because of the geometry. And so we have this parameter called S star over E. S star is the hybrid kinetic parameter, which tells you how um, stable it is from that top point of view, and the E, which is the elongation of how long it is. And so maybe fortuitously, thank you nature, uh, gave us a win here, which is that how we make these in these long solenoids is naturally very, very long. And so we can build these with a uh, very long lengths. And if we can drive them fast enough and hard enough and drive the ions to move at very high velocities, we can stabilize against those instabilities and hold them stable. And so we now know we can design with a given S star over E parameter, we can design these for very long lives. The theory of the systems we make say that they should last for a few microseconds at most. Us and others in the field have been able to make them last for thousands of microseconds, thousands of times what the stability, the, the basic 
on the basic criteria would tell you. And so we know now how to do this. And so we just designed them with this built into them. Can you uh, explain a little bit more that star over E? Are you given that or is that an emergent thing? So like at which stage is that the result or the the requirement? It's a great question. So it is a requirement of the system is that you must design it with this parameter in mind. The hard part is you have to design it with S star over E being satisfied the whole time. Right. And here's the extra trick here. S star over E is also a measure of temperature. Oh, and, boy. and 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 yep, where this it all comes back to temperature. The hotter you make them is the same thing, temperature is kinetic energy, is the faster you're spinning. So if you take your your top and you spin it faster, it's more stable, but you gotta make it hot. And so here's the trick. How do you make something hot that's starting cold? And it has to be hot by definition. And so that's part of the the challenge of what we do day to day is getting to these hot plasmas. And where people have other people have tried to make FRCs and not been very successful, it's because they couldn't get it hot enough fast enough. Is it fell over, it tilted before it got hot. And so we spend a lot of our electrical engineering. In some ways, Helion is more of an electrical engineering company than a fusion company some days, um, focusing on how to make the electronics fast enough to be able to get it hot enough soon enough that you can keep it stable the whole time. So you're trying to reach 100 million degrees. How do you get to that temperature fast? And by the way, what can you say to help somebody like me understand what 100 million degrees is like? It seems insane. What does that world look like? I guess just everything is moving really fast. Uh, like you said, you can't put anything mechanical in there. Yeah. So a couple of key things happen. So when gas is that hot, there's uh, we talk about the states of matter. You have solids where ice, it's cold. The atoms are now bound in a lattice structure together. They're held together. And then liquid, you've broken a lot of that lattice structure. They can move around. They have some kinetic energy, but they're still pretty contained. They stay in the bowl. Keep heating it. Now you're in gas. And now these particles are free to move around. They're moving around. They're bouncing off of each other all the time. And you can keep heating it from there. And that's where we talk about um, some more phases of matter. Um, we can add a little bit more physics here. Uh, we talk about rarefied gases. So when we think about most gases that, that humans interact with, they act like a fluid. And what I mean by that is that they're colliding with each other so often that the particles at any one place here, the air is roughly the same temperature as the air here, that these particles are bouncing off of each other. If, if you put a really hot one right here, it would then cool enough that all the air is roughly on the same temperature. Um, but you can be what's called rarefied. And this is like space. This is where now you have particles moving around, but they don't collide with each other very often. And so you can have one very, very high energy particle and very cold energy particle, and they may not even touch each other, but maybe occasionally they bang into each other, they collide, and then they transfer energy. And that's where we call rarefied. And then you can go even hotter than that. And that's where now the actual atomic states, which has uh, the nucleus, which is a proton and a neutron and an electron gets so hot that electron gets energized and then escapes leaves the system. Um, and now they're charged. You have a positive nucleus and a negative electron floating out. And that happens on the order of 10,000 degrees. So way hotter than what we're used to. But now we're going to go hotter. We're going to take this plasma and go even hotter. And what does that mean? At that point, a lot of the way we think about temperature doesn't really apply. The idea that you have these random motion of particles, because now they're all individual particles moving at very high velocity. So what it's really is a, is it, is a, a, a measurement of is velocity. It's really a measurement of how fast is that particle moving. Um, and... And that's how I really think about temperature when you get to that 100 million degrees. And so it does, it does some more complex things. If you have this high energy particle, that's why we like fusion, is moving at high velocity and there's another one moving at high velocity, they will come together, they will collide and they will fuse. Mm -hmm. But other things will happen. You don't want to touch that high velocity particle with any kind of material because it will collide with that material, damage that material, and usually like blow off some chunks of that material. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that. We keep those charged particles in a magnetic field. So they just bounce around and they don't ever touch anything. 
and that that's that's really important. Um, and so it's it's less thinking about it from the way we normally think about hot and cold, and more thinking about it from a velocity point of view. So what we should be imagining is uh, extremely fast moving. What is it? One million miles per hour? Is that accurate? That's the right kind of order for these systems. Crazy. And so you're looking for them to collide. Well, first of all, to get back, is there some interesting insights, tricks, anything you could say to the complexity of the problem of getting it to that high temperature quickly? So if temperature is velocity, that means they're moving quickly over a given amount of space. Speed is distance divided by time. And so um, if you have a, a machine of a certain size and it's moving very fast, that tells you the time that that particle is moving from place to place in that machine. Um, and in fact, if it's a million miles per hour, these are on the order of 100 kilometers per second, which you can flip that around and you can say you're moving at meters per microsecond. Mm -hmm. So feet per millionth of a second. <laughs> and so that fundamentally tells you, and we've known this, as soon as you say, I want to do fusion, you know you need to react to the universe in microseconds and, and be able to understand the system in that speed. And if you get it hotter, it goes even faster and you have to go faster. And so we look at those and that's how we think about the systems. We measure everything in microseconds, not in seconds. And so when you do fusion, it's pretty wild. It's literally a flash. Psh, fusion happens. Mm -hmm. And it's over. You start it. You do a lot of fusion. You recover energy from it. And then you turn it off before the human eye can really respond even. And there's a computer managing all this. Like how do you even program these kinds of systems to do the switching? Is there some innovation required there? So I'm continuously amazed by what the pioneers in fusion were able to do before the computer existed, because they had to control things at this scale. But maybe it was pretty hard and, and, and why we've been able to be take what they did and build on it, because now we use modern gigahertz scale computing to be able to do this. And so even when I started my career, we talked about like megahertz processors. Uh, megahertz is microseconds. That's great. You're kind of at the border of fast enough, but you can't do computation at that speed if if all it can do is respond in one microsecond. But now gigahertz means I can do a thousand operations in that one microsecond, so I can do more useful things. So we use mostly, this is way too fast for any human to respond to. So we use what's called programmable logic. So we program in sequences to the fusion system to be able to do this reversal. We pre-program it, and then we run a sequence, and then fusion happens. Um, and so in this sequence uh, programming language, we use a variety of them. Some of the fusion codes are actually written in Fortran still. Nice. And though a lot is now more and more run in Python. And so we do a lot of Python. We do some Java. And then we also have... Uh, because of the speed of this, it's a lot of assembly language programming. Mm -hmm. So we go right to the assembly level of the programmable logic FPGAs, and we program those. And so to be able to run one of these systems, we typically have a series of electrical switches that turn on this electrical current. Those are controlled via, via fiber optic because the wires are just too slow. And so fiber optic, I can respond. I can send photons at the speed of light. And so those fiber optics can respond in nanoseconds. And then I trigger those fiber optics with programmable logic that we've programmed in the hard as hardware assembly language. 